all of you. We will be discussing the anatomy questions of AIMS November 2019. Myself, Dr. Shilpi Agarwal. Now, in this AIMS November, if we see that uh, the, the questions which have been asked are mainly the image based question and in fact, the cadaveric images have also been given. So that means before attempting the question, you need to identify the specific structure and then only you can attempt the question. So for that, identification is important. Now we start with the questions. The first question is over here. In this, we have to tell that marked area is related to. If you see the picture over here, this is a simple picture which has been given for the kidney and the arrow is being on the anterior surface of the kidney. Now the kidney which has been marked over here, this is the left kidney. This is the left kidney. Now in the left kidney, we can very well see the hilum which is present over here. This is the hilum. If you see the kidney, it is a bean shaped structure with a concavity which is towards the me <coughs> medial side. This is the hilum. <coughs> and this convexity which is present is towards the outer side and so this is the lateral aspect. In the hilum, the structures, they are either entering or exiting the hilum and over here the three major structures are renal artery, renal vein and the renal pelvis. For the hilum of both, the right and the left kidney, the arrangement of the structures from anterior to posterior is VAP. This is the arrangement from anterior to posterior. <coughs> the most anterior structure is renal vein. Just behind it, we have the renal artery. And the most posterior structure is renal pelvis. So these are the three structures which are present at the position of the hilum. We can see over here the uh, this neuro, neurovascular structures, the vessels as well as the pelvis, the renal pelvis which is continuing below as a ureter. It is present over here near the hilum towards the medial aspect. Now when we talk about the anterior surface of left kidney over here specifically, for the left kidney, if we draw a schematic diagram, just anterior to the left kidney, just anterior to it we have the stomach which is present over here. So that means towards the upper side, the left kidney is related to the stomach and to be more specific to the fundus of the stomach. So over here this area will be related to the stomach. Now if you see towards the extreme left side, we have another organ which is the spleen which is present over here. So it will be related to the kidney towards the lateral side. Now as we come towards the lower portion, towards the lower aspect near the lower pole, we know the transverse colon is running like this. It continues as the descending colon and when it continues it takes a turn and that turn is given the term as left colic flexure. This is a left colic flexure. So the left colic flexure is related to the lower aspect of the left kidney and that too towards the lateral side. Now we have this portion over here. One portion is present over here towards the medial side. Now the intestinal coils, they are present over here. The coils are present over here. We know that the intestinal coils are present in the center of the uh, abdomen and to be more specific, the jejunal coils will be there. So these are the various visceras which will be related to the anterior aspect of the left kidney from upper side we see the stomach and the spleen and towards the lower side we see the left colic flexure and the jejunal coils. Now towards the most upper aspect or towards the upper pole, we already know the upper pole is having this suprarenal gland. This is a suprarenal gland. So all these structures will be making an impression towards the anterior surface of this left kidney and we can very well see over here, this is a picture which is showing the impressions of the viscera over the right and the left kidney. Now for the left kidney, which we have just discussed, we will just make those impressions. Towards the upper pole, we have discussed the suprarenal gland is related. So we will use the term as suprarenal area or the suprarenal impression. This is a suprarenal area, the left suprarenal gland. Then towards the outer aspect, 
it is related to the spleen so this is the splenic area just below this this whole area is related to the stomach so this is the gastric area this is the gastric area now as we go more lower down yes we have uh, one more structure that is the pancreas when we talk about the pancreas the pancreas is present in the c shaped duodenum and it is present obliquely so that the tail of the pancreas is going towards the splenic hilum so this middle area it is related to the pancreas so as we come down over here this area in the middle it is related to the pancreas so this is the pancreatic area towards the lower aspect this area is related to the colic left colic flexor so it is termed as colic area and on this side this is a medial aspect it is related to the duodenal coil so this is the duodenal area so all these are the anterior relations of the left kidney now if we talk about the anterior relations of the right kidney we can see over here this is for the right kidney we can make a schematic diagram to explain this now if this is the right kidney over here also towards the upper pole it is related to the suprarenal gland this is the suprarenal gland then we know the kidney on the right side it is lying just posterior to the liver so the majority of the portion is related to the liver then as we come towards the lower aspect the right colic flexure the ascending colon it continues as a transverse colon and this is the right colic flexure which will be related to it and towards the inner aspect over here the this area will be related to the duodenum or the duodenal coils towards the hilum this area which is near the hilum it is related to the duodenal loop and to be more specific it is related to the second part of duodenum the second part of the duodenum it is running like this so we can see that all these viscera are being related to the anterior aspect of the right kidney that means the suprarenal gland then the liver is there second part of duodenum and towards the lower aspect we have the right colic flexor and the duodenum now if you see uh, the picture over here this is for the right kidney so if you see towards the right kidney this is a suprarenal area then near the hilum if this is the hilum towards here this is related to second part of the duodenum so we have labeled it as duodenal area area then a majority of the area is related to the liver so this is the hepatic area as we come towards the lower aspect towards the outer side this area is related to the right colic flexure so we have termed it as colic area and this small area over here is related to the duodenal coils duodenal area this is for the right kidney now if you come back to the question over here in this if we see this picture over here it is the arrow is being marked over this area and this area as we have just discussed is related to the stomach so the answer for this question is the stomach now we come to the next question the next question over here says a lesion is marked in the marked structure it leads to what now if we see the picture which has been given to us over here this is the inferior aspect of the brain and the arrow is specifically towards the brain stem and in the brain stem to to on the medulla if we see over here this portion is a brain stem portion this hole is a brain stem then very well we can say this is a cerebrum 
and towards here these two lower lobes these are the cerebellum. This is a basic identification of this inferior surface of the brain. Now if we see in the brain stem, the brain stem is having three parts. It is having midbrain, a small portion midbrain, then an expanded portion pons and then a cylindrical portion which is termed as medulla and it continues as a spinal cord. So this portion is midbrain, this is pons. and this portion is medulla. If you try to identify it over here, this, this is the portion which is the midbrain portion. I will just label it as uh, this is a midbrain. Then as we go lower down, this area is pons and towards this lower area, this is the medulla. So now we know that the arrow is on the medulla and if you see specifically in the medulla, this arrow is on an oval elevation which is present just near the midline. There is an oval elevation which is present over here on either side of the midline and the arrow is over there. So now we come back to this schematic diagram over here. If this is the midline, there is a oval elevation which is present on either side of this midline and this is the point where the arrow has been put over here. This oval elevation is termed as pyramids. This is pyramid and the structure which is lying deep to the pyramid is a pyramidal tract which is also termed as the corticospinal tract. Now this is the point where the pyramidal tract they cross to the other side and over here it is creating this elevation and that is why it is given the term as the pyramids. Now if you go more lateral to the pyramids, there are elevations on either side of this pyramid and these elevations they are termed as the olive. This is olive and the olive elevation is due to the olivary nucleus which is lying deep to it. As we go more lateral to it, this area which is more lateral to it, it is the inferior cerebellar peduncle. The inferior cerebellar peduncle. Now all these features, the, uh, the pyramid, olive and the inferior cerebellar peduncle, these are visualized from the ventral aspect of this medulla. <clears throat> now we know that the arrow is on the pyramid and deep to the pyramid lies the pyramidal tract or the corticospinal tract. Now if we talk about the pyramidal tract, this is a picture which is showing the pyramidal tract. Now the fibers they are coming from the motor areas of the cerebrum. This is the motor area of the cerebrum and few fibers are coming from the sensory areas also. The fibers they specifically arise from the pyramidal cells which are present over here and the large pyramidal cells which are termed, uh, termed as bed cells. Now from here the fibers, they form the corona radiata, they converge at one point and then they form, uh, they form this internal capsule which is running between the nucleus. So this is the corona radiata, this is the internal capsule. Then the fibers, they are further running down. This portion is midbrain, it simply runs down through the midbrain. This portion is pons, in the pons also it is simply running down. As we reach the medulla, at this point it is creating this elevation termed as pyramids and as well as the crossing of the fibers will take place over here. If we, if we see this picture over here, we can see the fibers are crossing and going to the other side. These are termed as the lateral corticospinal tract. Around 80 to 85 percent of the fibers, they cross the midline and they are termed as the lateral corticospinal tract. The few fibers that is around 15 to 20 percent, uh, these fibers they do not cross or they are the uncrossed fibers. 
and these are termed as the anterior corticospinal tract. So these are the fibers which are going uncrossed. Now in this if we see lower down <coughs> the, anterior the anterior corticospinal fibers they run lower down in the spinal cord. This is the spinal cord and in the spinal cord at the level of exit they will cross. So we can very well see these fibers they are crossing the midline at the level of exit. So that shows that the corticospinal fibers all the fibers they ultimately cross the midline. The lateral corticospinal tract fibers they are crossing at the level of the medulla and the anterior corticospinal tract they are crossing a level below that is at the level of the at the level of the spinal cord. So now if the injury is at the pyramidal tract, if the injury is at this level then it will lead to hemiplegia and that too of the other side. So we use the term as contralateral hemiplegia. So if we come back to the question, the lesion in the marked structure leads to, answer is option D that is the contralateral hemiplegia. If you see the rest of the options, the ataxia and the vertigo, these are due to, uh, uh, these are the symptoms which are seen in the lateral medullary syndromes. And if you talk about the ipsilateral facial nerve palsy, these are the lower motor neuron, lower motor neuron facial palsy, the facial nerve palsy. In this the fibers when they have originated from the facial nucleus after that if they are injured it leads to the lower motor neuron kind of facial palsy and in that in that situation the ipsilateral facial nerve palsy will be there and the course for that nerve is totally different it is traversing through the uh, the petrous part of temporal bone that it is related to the inner ear middle ear and then it comes out from the stylum astroid foramen over here and it enters the face so the course is altogether the different altogether different and over here the answer for this question is con contralateral hemiplegia. Come to the next question. In this, if we see the next question, it is a cadaveric picture. The question is the lesion of the marked structure leads to loss of sensory supply at. Now, in this, first of all, we should be able to identify the structure and then we will be able to answer the, according to the options. Now, if we see the cadaveric picture over here, this is a cadaveric picture of the cubital fossa of the upper limb. The, air, uh, the marked area over here is labeled as A over here. So this is the marked area over here. We have to identify this structure. Now when we talk about the cubital fossa, we already know that it is having medial and the lateral boundaries. <coughs> we will just discuss first of all the boundaries. If this is the arm, then we say that uh, if this is the lower end of the humerus, we have a muscle which is present on the medial side and it is running obliquely like this. This muscle is pronator teres. This is a pronator teres and it is forming the medial boundary. It is forming the medial boundary of the cubital fossa. Then there is a muscle which is present on the lateral aspect and it is running straight downwards. This muscle is the brachioradialis muscle. And this brachioradialis muscle it is forming the lateral boundary. So now we know that the muscle which is present on the medial side is pronator teres and the muscle which is present on the lateral side is the brachioradialis. And if we see in the arm over here, this medial sided muscle it is crossing the forearm from medial to the lateral side like this. So it is running obliquely and the muscle on the lateral side it is going straight downwards. So that means if we see a muscle which is running obliquely like this, we can very well say that this muscle is pronator teres and by that we can identify that this is the medial side. Now if this is the triangle cubital fossa, we say that the apex is pointing downwards and this is the base. The base is formed by imaginary line which is passing through the epicondyles of the humerus. 
So, this is the base. Now, we come back to the picture over here. In this, if we see, we can now visualize a muscle which is present over here and it is running obliquely like this. This muscle which is running obliquely over here, this is the pronator teres. This is the pronator teres and that shows that this is the medial aspect. So, we will just write medial side. This is the medial side, this is the lateral side. Now, we have identified the pronator teres. After that, if we see the muscle which is running straight downwards like this, this muscle is brachioradialis. Now, we have identified the muscles, the pronator teres and the brachioradialis. Now, we next need to identify the contents of this fossa. Now, to identify the contents of this fossa, we will just first of all discuss what are the structures passing through this cubital fossa. If this is the cubital fossa over here, we say that this is the triangle, the brachioradialis muscle over here and this is the pronator teres muscle which we have just discussed. Now, the contents, there are four contents which are passing through this fossa and we use a mnemonic MBBR. And this is from medial to the lateral side. This is from medial to the lateral side. The most medial structure is the median vein, median nerve. This is a median nerve. The nerve will be passing over here from the, me, uh, the most medial structure. This is the first. Second is the brachial artery. The brachial artery is running lateral to the median nerve and in the fossa only it divides into the radial and the ulnar artery. So, this is the second structure. The third structure is biceps tendon. So, the tendon of biceps, the tendon of the biceps, the muscle which is coming from above, it forms a tendon over here which is lying lateral to this brachial artery. So, this is the third structure the tendon of the biceps and then as we go most laterally, the most laterally we find a nerve which is present over here. This is the fourth structure and this is a branch of the radial nerve. So, the fourth structure on the most lateral side is radial nerve and to be more specific the superficial branch of radial nerve. The superficial branch of the radial nerve. So, from medial to lateral side, we have these four structures, the median nerve, brachial artery, the tendon of the biceps and the most lateral is the radial nerve, the superficial branch. Now, if you come back to the picture over here, <clears throat> we know that this is the medial side and this is the lateral side and the, if we try to see the contents, this structure which is running on the most medial side, this is the median nerve and the arrow has been or uh, this this is a structure which has been marked in this question. So, that means the median nerve we have we are actually talking about the median nerve in this question. Then if you identify a structure which is lying slightly lateral to it, this is a structure we can see it dividing. This is the brachial artery. As we go more laterally, we can see a muscle which is present whose tendon is coming down like this. This is a muscle which is present over here biceps and its tendon is coming down over here. So, this is the biceps, the biceps tendon. And as we go more laterally over here, we can visualize uh, that radial nerve is cannot be seen over here, but uh, if we see a thin nerve which is coming on the lateral aspect of this biceps tendon and then that will be the radial nerve. Now, over here we have identified this structure that is the median nerve which is the structure we have talking about over here. We will just see one more cadaveric picture so that you are able to identify all the structures which are forming the contents. If you again see over here, the muscle which is present on this side 
is pronator teres. We have already discussed this muscle going lower down is brachioradialis. So that means this is medial side, this is lateral. Now we have to identify the structures which are present over here. Now this nerve which is running down over here, now we can very well say this is the median nerve. I will just write the initials median nerve. As we go literally we can see this structure, this artery which is going down and it is dividing into two branches. Now this is the brachial artery. As we go more lateral, we can see a tendon which is present over here coming from this muscle above. This is the tendon of the biceps brachii. And on the lateral aspect over here, we can see this nerve which is running down. This is the radial nerve. So we have identified the various structures on this cadaveric picture. Now we will talk about the median nerve. In the question we are actually talking about the sensory supply of the median nerve. So we will talk about the sensory supply of the median nerve in the hand. We know that this median nerve is passing deep to the flexor retinaculum then it divides into the various branches, it supplies some various muscles of the hand and it is giving supply to the skin of the hand on the palmar aspect as well as on the dorsal aspect. If you see on the palmar aspect it is giving supply to the lateral three and a half fingers and the adjacent palm area. If you draw a schematic diagram for this, for the palmar aspect, for the palmar side, <clears throat> we have just said the lateral three and a half area and the adjacent palm area, this is completely supplied by the median nerve. So this whole area is being supplied by the median nerve. So this is for by the median nerve and the rest of the area that is towards the <clears throat> medial side, the one and a half fingers and the adjacent palm area, it will be supplied by the ulnar nerve. So this area, the rest of the area over here, this is supplied by the ulnar. It is supplied by the ulnar nerve. Now over here if we see in the hand if we see over here near the base of the thumb there is an eminence which is present and it is due to the thinar group of the muscles present over here. So this eminence is termed as thinar eminence. Just opposite to this over here there is a group of hypothenar muscles producing an eminence at this point this is the hypothenar eminence. Now if we draw these two eminence on this schematic picture over here so almost this will be the location of thinar eminence. and the hypothenar eminence will be present over here. Now we can say the skin over the thinar eminence, it will be supplied by the median nerve. The skin over the hypothenar eminence, it will be supplied by the ulnar nerve. Apart from this, if we see the interdigital clefts, the interdigital clefts which are present between the fingers and if we label it over here, this is the first interdigital cleft, second, third and the fourth. So for the interdigital cleft or the web space, the skin at the interdigital cleft for the first, second and third, we can very well see it is being supplied by median nerve. And the skin at the fourth interdigital cleft, it is being supplied by the ulnar nerve. Now this is for the palmar aspect. Now if we talk about the dorsal aspect, we will discuss that too. The dorsal aspect, Now when we talk about the dorsal aspect, we have the nail beds which are present over here. In this, the lateral three and uh, the medial three and a half fingers along with the adjacent hand area is again supplied by the ulnar nerve and it includes the nail beds of the, these fingers also. So this area 
same it is applied by Anna now. When we talk about the nail beds of rest of fingers, the nail beds of lateral three and a half fingers, it is supplied by the median nerve. So this blue colored area is by median nerve and the rest of the area, the rest of the fingers along with the adjacent hand area, it is being supplied by the radial nerve. So all this area, it is being supplied by the radial nerve. Now if in this we can say, now if we talk about the nail beds over here, the nail bed of the thumb, the nail bed of the index finger and the nail bed of the middle finger, they are solely, they are only supplied by the median nerve if you see the picture over here. When we talk about the nail bed of this index, uh, of this ring finger, this is the nail bed of the ring finger, over here it is being supplied by the median nerve as well as the ulnar nerve. And when we talk about this little finger over here, it is only being supplied by the ulnar nerve. So this is the supply of the nail beds to the different fingers. Then we know that towards the dorsal aspect just near the base of the thumb, there is an area which is termed as anatomical snub box over here. And if we draw it schematically over here, this will be the almost location of this anatomical snub box. And when we talk about the skin over the anatomical snub box, then the skin over the anatomical snub box will be supplied by the radial nerve. So these are the various aspects of the sensory supply over here. Now if we come back to the question, if we come back to the question, the question is a lesion of the marked structure that is the median nerve, it leads to a sensory loss of the nail bed of the index finger, yes this is correct. The skin of the hypothenar eminence, this is wrong because it is being supplied by the ulnar nerve. The fourth interdigital cleft we have just talked about, it is supplied by ulnar nerve. The tip of the little finger, again it is supplied by the ulnar nerve. So the answer for this question is nail bed of the index finger. Now in this uh, few students have said that the one of the option was tip of the, rad the radius or uh, they are not able to define the complete option. Now the tip of the radial chalet process can be asked, if we say the tip of the radial chalet process, it is lying over here. And this area is the area of the forearm just proximal to the wrist joint. And this area is being supplied by the lateral cutaneous nerve of forearm. The lateral cutaneous nerve of forearm which supplies this area, it is uh, arising or it is a branch of the musculocutaneous nerve which is altogether different. Now we come to the next question. <coughs> Now in this question you have to identify the marked layer in the given image. Over here this area has been marked. Few students say, have said that this layer was asked. Now in this if any of the layer is being asked we should be able to answer it. Now first of all we need to identify all these layers. When we talk about this histological picture, this histological picture is a characteristic picture of retina. And we know that there are 10 layers which we can identify over here. So we are basically having 10 layers in the retina, in the histological ima uh, image of this retina. And they are in the form of, long, uh, of horizontal areas. Now when you see the histological image of this retina, you can see the horizontal appearances of this. You can see one horizontal area is there, one, another horizontal area, another horizontal. So they appear like in the form of layers. When such kind of pattern is there, you can very well say that the, this is the histological picture of the retina. Now next you have to identify the 10 layers. But when you are seeing the, when you are seeing it practically, you can very well identify the various layers. Now the layers which you should be able to identify by seeing this picture. Now first of all, you try to see the most pigmented layer. Now you can see this is a layer which has, which is the most pigmented layer which we can see over here. And this is actually the pigment layer or the pigment epithelium which is present in the retina. And it is just adjacent to the choroid. So the layer which is present over here, this is the choroid. And this is the pigment layer. Now when we see the eyeballs, when we see the eyeball, the layers of the eyeball, the outermost layer is the sclera, then inner to it we have the choroid layer 
and the innermost layer is the retinal layer. So that means after identifying this, we can say this is the outer side and this is the inner side. <clears throat> now the basic layers which we are able to identify it by the first view of this picture, we can very well say that there are nuclei which are present over here. So we say they are a group of nucleus which are present over here. Again there is a group of nucleus which is present over here at this point. Now we can say that this group which is present on the outer side, it is the outer nuclear layer. This is the outer nuclear layer. And the nuclear layer which is or the group of the neurons which is present towards the inner side, we can label it as inner nuclear layer. This is the inner nuclear layer. So we have identified the pigment layer, then we know that adjacent to it we have this choroid layer, then we have identified the outer and the inner nuclear layer. Now the portions which are in between that, they are eosinophilic portions and they are not having the, uh, the nucleus or we say the bodies of these neurons. Now if you see over here, just inner to the pigment layer, we can see that the layer it appears to be having vertical uh, kind of pattern. This is actually the peripheral process of the rods and cones. So we say that this layer is the layer of rods and cones. It is a layer of the rods and cones and it is basically the peripheral process which are present over here. Now when we see this layer which is present between the outer and the inner nuclear layer, over here we can see the fibers they are present and they are actually this layer is actually the synapsing of the exons and the dendrites and we use the term as a plexiform layer. Again just inner to this inner nuclear layer this is also a plexiform layer so we have labeled it as this is the outer plexiform. and this is the inner plexiform. As we go more inner to it, we can again visualize neuronal bodies over here, which are larger and they are uh, sparsely, uh, they are placed slightly uh, on a distance. This is the ganglion cells and this layer is termed as ganglionic cell layer. So we have identified the various layers which are present over here. Now when we talk about the pigment layer, this is a layer uh, which is having a cuboidal epithelium and it is filled with the melanin. So it is, it is showing more pigmented kind of appearance when we see under the microscope. So it is a cuboidal epithelium, the cells are cuboidal cells. The layer of the rods and cones we have already discussed, these are the peripheral process of the rods and cones and uh, their shape may vary. If the rod is present, then the process are rod shaped and if the cones is there, then the process is conical in shape. So for the rod, the process, they appear like this and for the cones, the process, they become conical. Then in this layer, outer nuclear layer, the outer nuclear layer is basically having the nuclei of rods and cones. These are the nuclear rods and cones. Then this inner plexiform layer, this inner plexiform layer is uh, a synapse between the exons of these rods and cones. and the cells which are present next to it that will be in the inner nuclear layers and those cells are bipolar cells. So they have the dendrites, the dendrites of bipolar cells and the horizontal cells present over here. So this is forming the outer plexiform layer. Now when we come to the inner nuclear layer which we have just mentioned over here, this inner nuclear layer, the inner nuclear layer will be having the neuron, the, the nucleus or the neuronal body of the bipolar cells.
the bipolar cells are there. Apart from the bipolar cells, we have the horizontal cells and also the amacrine cells. These are the cells which uh, all together they form the inner nuclear layer and this in this the predominant cell is the bipolar cell. Now we come to the next layer over here, the inner plexiform layer. The inner plexiform layer now will be having the exons which are uh, the exons of these bipolar cells as well as the processes of the amicrine cells which will be synapsing with the dendrites of the next layer that is a ganglion cell. So for the inner plexiform, we have the exons of bipolar the synapse of exons of bipolar cells with dendrites of ganglion cells. The innermost ganglionic cell layer which we have mentioned over here, it is having the ganglion cells itself, the neuronal bodies of the ganglion cells. Now these are the few layers which we have discussed which we can visualize over here. When we talk about the complete 10 layers, now this is the same image but this is a schematic picture. This is a pigmented layer which we can see over here. So we can say this is a pigment layer, I am writing the initials only. Then this was the choroid which we have mentioned and outer to it we have this sclera. So this is the outer side, now this pigment layer as we go deeper to it or we go inner to the, this aspect, we have already mentioned this is the layer of the rods and cones, so layer of rods and cone which we have already discussed. After this layer comes the a limiting layer which is termed as external limiting layer. Now this external limiting layer it is actually contributed by the process of the Muller cells. The process of the Muller cells, the Muller cells are the supporting cells which are present in the retina and it is present throughout the layers of the retina. The processes which are reaching over here to this side they are forming a zonula, uh, the zonula uh, occludens with the, uh, with the nuclei of the rods and cones and it leads to the formation of this external limiting layer. This external limiting layer, it is present like this over here. Now the next layer which we have already discussed is outer nuclear layer. This is outer nuclear, this is outer plexiform, this is inner nuclear and this is inner plexiform, already discussed. Then we have this ganglionic cell layer. This is a ganglion cell layer. Now as we come more inner to it, now we will be having the exons of these ganglion cells. So this layer it is having the exons of the ganglion cell and they together they form the optic nerve. So we term this layer inner to it as optic nerve fiber layer. Now just inner to the optic nerve fiber layer at this point. This is now another limiting membrane but because it is towards the inner side now we label it as internal limiting layer or the membrane. This also is formed by the processes of the Muller cells. Now these are, this is a picture which is showing all the layers and if we start counting from outer to the inner side, the first layer is this pigment layer, second is the layer of rods and cones, the third is the external limiting layer, fourth is outer nuclear, then we have outer plexiform, inner nuclear, inner plexiform, ganglion cell layer, the optic nerve fiber layer and the tenth layer is inner internal limiting membrane. So these are the various layers of the retina. And when we come back to the picture over here, we have already identified this layer which has been marked over here. This is the outer plexiform layer. 
this is the outer plexiform layer. So, the answer for this question is this outer plexiform. Now, we come to the next question. The next question is that uh, the arrow mark muscle is being supplied by. Now, if you see this picture over here, this is a coronal section. This is a coronal section of the head and neck going like this. And if you see over here, we can uh, on the upper portion, we can see this is the brain or the cerebrum present over here. Then this is a section of the orbit which will be having the eyeball and around this we are having the orbital uh, fascia and the orbital fat in which the muscles are present. This area is the nasal cavity. In the nasal cavity we can see the projections which are going towards the medial side. These projections are the concha. So if you specifically see over here this one is a nasal septum and these projections are the concha. Now, these cavity, this cavity which is seen over here is the maxillary sinus and as we come lower down over here this is the oral cavity and in the oral cavity if you see over here we can visualize this section, this section over here is the section of the tongue. Now, after this basic identification we will come to the marked area. We see this is the arrow marked area and this is on a muscle which is present within the orbit. <clears throat> so, we will just see uh, this picture again over here. Now, if this is the eyeball, on the superior aspect of the eyeball we have the muscles which are attached to it and they are running in such a pattern that towards the most superior side we have this muscle which is the levator palpebria superioris. This is the levator palpebria superioris which is for the elevation of the upper eyelid and this is the muscle which is present on the most superior aspect when you view the eyeball or the orbit from the superior side. Just deep to it we have this muscle superior rectus. This is the superior rectus. When we visualize it from the inferior aspect, a muscle which is present over here this is the inferior rectus. And as we go more inferiorly over here, this is the inferior oblique. Now we are left with the medial and the lateral rectus and the superior oblique. If this is the medial side over here, if this is the medial side over here or we will make the medial side Uh, we will make it corresponding to this picture. So, we will draw the medial side over here. On the medial side, we have this muscle which is medial rectus. Just above the medial rectus, there is a muscle which is superior oblique. This is a superior oblique. On the lateral side, we have only one muscle and this is the lateral rectus. LR is lateral rectus. So, these are the various muscles which are present over here. In this, we know the recti muscles, they are positioned according to its name, the superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus and the lateral rectus and they are running and they get inserted just in front of the equator. When we talk about the superior oblique and the inferior oblique. The superior oblique it is running on the medial side and uh, slightly above, slightly we can say superior. So, it is running superior medially, it is running superior medially like this and then it comes back it around, uh, it comes back and it, it is inserted on the eyeball behind the equator. So, when it is running like this, so it is, it is present on the medial aspect as well as superiorly. So, we can say, uh, we can see over here the muscle which is present over here, this is the superior oblique on the medial side but slightly superior. When we talk about the inferior oblique, the inferior oblique is a muscle which is present on the most inferior side and when we take a section, the inferior oblique is seen over here. This is the most inferior muscle. 
Now, by this schematic diagram, we now know that which muscle is placed at which position. So, if we come back to this picture over here, if we come back to this picture over here and we see the arrow has been put over a muscle which is on the medial side but slightly superiorly. So, this muscle is superior oblique as we have discussed. Just inferior to this, this muscle present medially, this is medial rectus, this is lateral rectus. If we see on the superior most side, we have two muscle sections. The upper one is LPS as we have discussed, the lower one is superior rectus. Inferiorly again, we will have two muscle sections. This will be the inferior rectus and this will be the inferior oblique. So, now we can see the muscle which has been marked is superior oblique. So, the muscle which is being marked over here, this muscle which is marked over here, this one is the superior oblique muscle. Now, when we talk about the nerve supply of these extraocular muscles, all the extraocular muscles, they are being supplied by the oculomotor nerve. They all are supplied by oculomotor nerve, which is the third cranial nerve, except, except the lateral rectus and the superior oblique, except lateral rectus, which is supplied by the sixth cranial nerve that is abducent and the superior oblique which is supplied by the fourth cranial nerve that is the trochlear nerve. So, we can say this superior oblique which we have identified over here is being supplied by the fourth cranial nerve that is the trochlear nerve and if you come back to the question over here, the answer for this question will become trochlear nerve that is B. Now we come to the next question. The next question over here says that the mark structure is supplied by all the following arteries except if you see this picture over here, the marked area over here is the right ventricle. Now if you see this portion, if we see over here, this portion is the right atrium. Then this whole area is right ventricle as being labeled over here and the portion which is present on the left side and going till the apex region, this is the left ventricle. This picture which has been shown over here is the ventral aspect of the heart. This is the apex formed by the left ventricle. So, we have identified the structure over here, this is the right ventricle and we are talking about the arterial supply of the right ventricle. When we talk about the arterial supply of the heart, we know that it is being supplied by two coronary arteries, the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. The right and the left coronary artery and for the distribution, if we talk about the distribution of these right and the left coronary arteries, the right coronary artery is the one which is mainly supplying the right ventricle. So, the right ventricle is mainly supplied by the right coronary artery except a small area which is near the anterior interventricular groove or sulcus. Except a small portion near anterior interventricular groove. Apart from supplying the right ventricle and the right atrium, it also supplies the left ventricle, a portion of the left ventricle towards the posterior side. It is supplying the majority of the, uh, sorry, it is supplying the posterior portion of the interventricular septum also and it supplies a portion of life, left atrium also. So, these are the basic structures being supplied by the right coronary artery. When we talk about the left coronary artery, it is the one which mainly supplies the left atrium and the majority of portion of the left ventricle. In the left ventricle, except a small area which is being supplied by the right coronary artery, 
when we talk about the interventricular septum being supplied by the left coronary artery, it is supplying the majority of the interventricular septum on the anterior portion, anterior side. So, for the right ventricle, we have said it is mainly supplied by the right coronary artery except a small area. Now, this small area which we have mentioned over here, it is actually supplied by anterior interventricular artery. Anterior interventricular artery also known as the left anterior descending artery. This anterior interventricular or the left anterior descending artery is a branch of left coronary artery. Now, when we come back to the options over here, this right ventricle is supplied by all arteries except. <clears throat> now, we know the right coronary artery is supplying it, then this inter anterior interventricular artery. So, we can say the interventricular branch because it, over here it is not mentioned. If it is specifically mentioned, then it will be the anterior interventricular branch. Then we see the rest of the options, the marginal artery, the right marginal artery which is a branch of the right coronary artery, it is also supplying this right ventricle. Now this option, the diagonal artery, the diagonal artery is a branch of the left coronary artery. So it is in no way supplying the right ventricle and the answer for this question will be the diagonal artery. The diagonal artery, it is a branch of left coronary artery. So it will not be supplying the right ventricle. Now, in this, uh, the option A is given as marginal artery. The marginal artery can be of the right side or it can be of the left side. If the marginal artery is of the right side, it is a branch of the right coronary artery. The marginal artery towards the left side is a branch of left coronary artery. So, in this, we, uh, if we see among the four options, the diagonal artery is the one which is completely coming or which is only a branch of left coronary artery. So, it becomes the answer of the exclusion over here. So, the answer for this question is diagonal artery. Now, the next question over here is which structure does not contribute to the pointed structure over here. If you see, now this is a picture, cadaveric picture which is towards the posterior aspect or the dorsal aspect of the hand over here and the muscles which will be present over here will be the extensor muscles. The extensor muscles, they come towards the digits, towards the dorsal side and uh, when it comes over here, and it is inserting on the phalanx over here, it forms a certain kind of extension which is given the term as dorsal digital expansion. This dorsal digital expansion is triangular in shape and it is mainly contributed by the extensor digitorum and also by the extensor pollicis longus. The rest of the extensors, they are also coming and getting attached to this ex uh, dorsal digital expansion. Now, this dorsal digital expansion, it is triangular in appearance. If we see over here, this is a picture which is showing the dorsal digital expansion. It is triangular like this and we can say the apex is towards the distal side. The apex is towards the distal side and the base of this triangle or this expansion is towards the, uh, towards the metacarpals. Or towards, we can say, uh, if we talk about the base, over here, this is the base. The base is towards the head of the metacarpals and the apex is going and getting attached to the phalanx. Now, when we go towards the apex, this expansion, it is having a medial portion. This is the medial portion and we have a lateral portion which goes and gets united and it goes still distal. So, the middle portion or the median portion, it is get, getting attached to the middle phalanx and the rest of the portion which is going on the lateral aspects, it fuses and it is attached to the distal phalanx over here. So, the attachments of the apex of this expansion is on the middle as well as on the distal phalanx. Now, on this dorsal digital expansion, apart from the extensor muscles, there is attachment of the palmar and the dorsal interstitial as well as the lumbricals. Now, where in this picture we can see these lumbrical and the interosseous muscles, they are getting attached to it. The lumbrical and the interosseal, which has been shown over here, this is the lumbrical and this is one of the interosseal muscle. This is attached to the lateral aspect of this 
digitation and one interosci muscle is attached to the medial aspect. So, we can see the lumbricals are always attached to the lateral aspect of this dorsal digitation. Now, what we have to tell uh, next is that which lumbrical is inserted where and which interosci are inserted to or attached to which dorsal digital expansion. Now, this is a picture showing the lumbricals. This is the first lumbrical, second, this one is third and this one is the fourth. These are the four lumbricals which have been shown over here and if we see for all the four lumbricals they are taking origin from this flexor digitorum profundus tendon and all the muscles they are running on the lateral aspects of the fingers and they go laterally and they go slightly posteriorly to get attached to the uh, this expansion. So, we can say all the lumbricals all are attached to lateral margin of this expansion and if you see the first lumbrical is attached to the second expansion, the second lumbrical is attached to the third expansion, the third one is attached to the fourth expansion on the fourth finger and the fourth one is attached to the fifth expansion. If we see the dorsal digital expansion which will be present over the thumb, it is getting no attachment from the lumbricals. Now, we come to the next, this is a picture which is showing the palmar interosci, the palmar interosci 4 in number and if we see their attachments, we can very well see there is no attachment of the palmar interosci on the middle finger, this is the middle finger. The palmar interosci they are present in such a way if this is the first, second, third and fourth, <coughs> they are getting attached the first and second. If you see over here, the first palmar interosci comes like this, second palmar interosci it comes like this. The first and second they are attached to the lateral margins of the digits that is of the thumb and uh, of the index finger. When we see for the third and fourth, the third and fourth they are attached to the medial margins of this uh, ring finger and the little finger. So, the middle finger is getting no attachment of this palmar interosci. Now we come to the dorsal interosci. This picture is showing the picture of dorsal interosci. First, second, third and fourth dorsal interosci. If we see the middle finger is getting attachment of two dorsal interosci that is second and third. This index finger is getting attachment of first dorsal interosci and the fourth one is getting attached to this ring finger. So there is no attachment of dorsal interosci to the thumb and to the little finger. Now we come back to this picture which has been shown over here. Now if you see the arrow or the mark is towards the middle finger. Now we have seen the attachments of all the three muscles, lumbricals, palmar and the dorsal interosci and in that we have seen a characteristic feature that the palmar interosci is not attached to this middle finger. So therefore it will not be attached to the dorsal digital expansion which will be present on the middle finger. So, if you see the options over here, the answer of this question will be the palmar interosci. The rest of the muscles, they are attached to the dorsal digital expansion of the middle finger. Now, the next question is which of the following does not have branches in the brachial plexus? Now, these are the different levels of the brachial plexus. If you see over here in this picture over here, we have the roots from C5 to T1 <coughs> which lead to the formation of the brachial plexus. These are the roots portion. Now these roots they unite to form trunks. This is the trunk portion, upper trunk, middle trunk and the lower trunk. So in the red color we have the trunk. The upper trunk is formed by C5 and C6. The middle trunk is formed by C7. The lower trunk is formed by C8 and T1. This is the C T1. Then after that further the divisions occur. This is the anterior and the posterior divisions. This is the anterior posterior division. This is the anterior and the posterior divisions. So these are the divisions. And further if we see there is the formation of the cords. 
this is a, this, these are the chords which are being formed by these divisions. So the chords formation are there. <coughs> the entire division of upper trunk and the middle trunk they lead to the formation of the uh, lateral chord of the uh, and the posterior divisions of all it leads to the formation of the posterior chord and uh, the entire division of the lower one or the lower trunk it leads to the formation of the of the medial chord and they further will be divided into various nerves. Now over here if we see the chords will be giving the various branches so that means the chords will be having the branches. When we talk about the roots there are a few nerves which are arising from the roots also. When we talk about the roots one of the nerve which is arising from the roots is dorsal scapular nerve. The dorsal scapular nerve it is arising from the C5. We can see this nerve which is arising and going above this is the dorsal scapular nerve. Apart from this we have long thoracic nerve. The long thoracic nerve is arising from C5, C6, C7. So we can see a nerve which is going down like this having contributions from C5, C6 and C7. So these are two nerves which are arising from the roots. When we talk about the <coughs> trunk, in the trunk the upper trunk is giving origin to two nerves. So if we talk about the trunk, it is also giving origin to two nerves and specifically the upper trunk is giving origin. One is the suprascapular nerve and nerve to subclavius. So hereby we can see only portion which is not giving any branches is divisions. So the question for uh, the answer for this question will be divisions. It is the only portion which is not giving any branches. The next question is the mark structure is derived from. Now if you see the picture over here, the arrow has been put over here that means this portion, we know that this whole portion which is present at this point is interventricular septum. It is an interventricular septum and when we talk about the development of interventricular septum it is having two parts the membranous part and the muscular part. Now this is a schematic picture which is showing the development of interventricular septum. Towards the lower side there is a muscular part which is arising from the, uh, low pa uh, the lower portion of the primitive ventricle only over here. So this portion, this whole portion is the muscular part and this is the major part which is being contributed to the interventricular septum. Now there is a space which is present over here, this area. This is a gap which is present and a communication between the right and the left ventricle. This is termed as interventricular foramen. This is present initially and later on it is filled by uh, a component of the interventricular septum which is the membranous part. So in the next picture we can see there is a membrane which fills over here this is the membranous part of interventricular septum and this membranous part it is actually arising from endocardial cushions which are present over here these are over here we can see this is again the endocardial cushion the AV endocardial cushions. So the growth occurs from here it leads to the formation of the membranous septum membranous part and it fills up the interventricular foramen and it leads to a complete formation of the interventricular septum. So the interventricular septum one part is the muscular part another is the membranous part. Now the if you see the picture over here the arrow is towards the upper towards the upper part of this interventricular septum so that means it is on the membranous part. And we have just discussed the membranous part is developed from the endocardial cushions. So the answer for this question will be A that is the endocardial cushion. When we talk about the interatrial septum, the interatrial septum is being formed by the septum primum and the septum secundum. Now we come to the next question. <clears throat> In this next question we have to identify the marked structure over here. Again this is a cadaveric picture dissection cadaveric dissection picture and this is the picture at the level of the wrist 
Now, when we talk about the structures which are present at the level of the wrist, the vessels which are vessels as well as the nerves which are present over here. In the central part over here, we have a nerve, median nerve which runs deep to the flexor retinoculum and it reaches towards the palm. So, the central most structure over here, this nerve which is shown over here, this is the median nerve. which is further going and dividing into the various branches. As we see, <clears throat> this is the lateral side and this is the medial side. We can very well see the thumb is present over here. So, lateral and the medial side. Towards the most medial side, towards the most medial side over here, we have the ulnar vessels which are running over here along with the ulnar nerve and they are running superficial to the flexor retinoculum over here. So, if we see over here, we can visualize a nerve which is running. This is a nerve. The ulnar nerve is the one which is present most medially and slightly lateral to it, we have ulnar artery. This is the ulnar artery which is running like this. So, this is the ulnar nerve and this structure is ulnar artery. If you see over here, the ulnar nerve is the most medial structure and our structure is which is slightly lateral to it is the ulnar artery. These are the major structures which you see at the level of the wrist. If we go slightly or if we go extremely towards the lateral side, then on extreme lateral side towards uh, the base of the thumb over here, the artery which we visualize over here. This artery is the radial artery which is basically going towards the posterior side. So, the radial artery if you visualize over here we can visualize till this point only because from here the radial artery takes a turn and it goes posteriorly over here and it crosses through the anatomical snub box and it reaches towards the first interdigital cleft. So, we can see only a small portion of the radial artery over here. So, the structure which has been labeled over here is the ulnar nerve and the answer for this question is C. Now, the next question over here is the blood supply of the marked structure over here. If we see that this is a, is, is a sagittal section of brain in which we are able to visualize the medial part of the cerebrum. Now, if you see the various structures which are present over here, this C-shaped structure is corpus callosum. Then the band which is shown over here, this band is the fornix which has been actually labeled over here, the fornix. Then there is a membrane which is between the corpus callosum and the fornix. This is the septum pellucidum. This is the septum pellucidum. The area which is the area which is below this fornix. The area which is below this fornix, I will mark it with a black color, Wait, the color is not coming. The area which is below the fornix is the area which is uh, termed as thalamus. So, this area over here, this is the thalamus and still lower over here we have the hypothalamic region. So this is the hypothalamic region. Now, we have identified the various parts which have been shown over here and uh, the marked structure is the fornic structure. So, if we talk about the arterial supply of this area, uh, this is the arterial supply. We know that the brain over here or the cerebrum is being supplied by three arteries that is anterior, middle and the posterior cerebral arteries in which anterior and the middle, the anterior and the middle they are the branches of internal carotid artery and the posterior cerebral artery it is a branch of or it is a terminal branch of basilar artery. Now, when we see it supply on the superior lateral side and the medial side, this is the superior lateral aspect and this is the medial aspect. 
on the superior lateral aspect the majority of the area is being supplied by the middle cerebral artery because this middle cerebral artery is running in the lateral sulcus over here a small portion is being supplied from the frontal pole till this part by the anterior cerebral artery and the rest of the portion is by the posterior cerebral artery now when we come towards the middle medial side this is the portion which is showing the medial side in this we can very well see the majority of the supply is by the anterior cerebral artery this is the anterior cerebral artery which is supplying it towards the posterior pole or we can say towards the occipital lobe this area is being supplied by the posterior cerebral artery and only a very small portion being supplied by the middle cerebral artery now over here the branches of anterior cerebral and the posterior cerebral arteries are the one which will be supplying uh, the structures which are lying in between that is the structures which are present over here now when we talk about the fornix when we talk about the fornix the fornix if this is the fornix it is basically the projection fibers which are projecting from the hippocampus which is present slightly posterior and inferior side and the projection fibers are going anteriorly towards the mammillary body so the projection fibers from hippocampus to the mammillary body and from the mammillary body the fibers they further go towards the anterior nucleus of the thalamus when we see on the posterior aspect the fornix it is divided like this these are termed as the crusts of the fornix and further further it is termed as fimbria this is towards the posterior side in between the crust we have these connections which are termed as habenular commissure sorry hippocampal commissure this is a hippocampal commissure towards the anterior side again this fornix is divided into columns these are the columns of fornix so this is the anterior aspect this is a posterior aspect this columns these are the two columns which are going anteriorly and they cross anterior to or in front of the interventricular foramen and it goes downward towards the mammillary body now when we talk about the blood supply of this in in this according to the new edition of the grays the columns of the fornix these are being supplied by the anterior cerebral artery and the rest of the portion of the fornix is being supplied by the branches of the posterior cerebral artery the columns being supplied by branches of anterior cerebral artery and the rest of the fornix over here is being supplied by the posterior the branches of the posterior cerebral artery so that means the majority of the portion of the fornix is being supplied by the posterior cerebral artery so over here the branches of the posterior cerebral artery they are going above they supply the thalamus region they are supplying the telocoidea uh, the telocoroidea of the lateral ventricle as well as the as well as of the third ventricle which are present over here and just above that it is also supplying the fornix so the answer for this question the answer for this question will be posterior cerebral artery the fornix being supplied by the posterior cerebral artery now we come to the next question again this is a question and uh, if you see this image based question again it is of the cubital fossa in this uh, we have to identify one of the contents of the cubital fossa in the earlier question we have seen that the arrow was on the median nerve and in this picture again the arrow is on the nerve but if we try to identify it it is on the most lateral side now we already know that in the cubital fossa if this is the picture we know in the cubital fossa a muscle which is running from medial to the lateral side which is running obliquely this was the pronator teres 
it was forming the medial boundary so that means this is the medial side and this is the lateral side the muscle which goes straight downwards this is the brachioradialis and it is forming the lateral boundary now the contents of this cubital fossa over here we already know it is mbbr from medial to the lateral side so the nerve which will be present over here is the median nerve this is the median nerve then the artery which is present over here the next structure which is present over here the artery this is the brachial artery the brachial artery will be seen dividing into the radial and the ulnar then we have the tendon of a muscle present over here and this tendon is of biceps muscle so biceps tendon and as we go more laterally we will have a branch of radial nerve to be more specific the superficial branch of radial nerve the superficial branch of radial nerve this is the superficial branch of the radial nerve so these are the structures from medial to the lateral side and if we see towards the most lateral side we can identify a nerve that is the radial nerve we come back to this picture over here now if you see this picture over here the arrow is marked a and the arrow is on a nerve this is the arrow the marked structure now if you identify the various structures this is a muscle this is another muscle this is the pronator teres and this is the brachioradialis now if you see the contents over here we can very well see a nerve which is running on the most medial side this is the medial this is the lateral side this nerve is median nerve i am writing the initials then we can see a artery which is running downwards and it is further dividing into the branches this is the brachial artery then this muscle having its tendon over here this is the biceps muscle and its tendon then most laterally we can visualize this nerve over which the arrow has been put this nerve is going like this over here this is the radial nerve so the arrow is on the radial nerve and if we see there is a lesion of the radial nerve it leads to wrist drop so the answer for this question is a wrist drop so that is all for the anatomy questions being asked in the aims recall uh, aims examination thanks to you and if you see all these questions uh, they are the basic questions only the thing is that you have to correlate all these uh, questions with the pictures also you should be able to identify the mark structures and then only you will be able to answer the questions thank you